Okay, so sorry for long in, in coming here. Um, I want to get into uh, sketching, and this is chapter four. And unfortunately, it might be too late for some of you. Sorry. And we're going to discuss graphing and the importance of graphing, polynomials. But I also want you to recognize how much you can spot before you even start. Okay. So when you're dealing with a polynomial, and the biggest term, that's what you want to focus on, is even. It's always going to start in quadrant 2. It's always going to end in quadrant 1, and that's how you read it. The exception, of course, is if the leading term has a negative in front of it. And then it's always going to start in quadrant 3 and end in quadrant 4. That's what a negative does. But it's the true rule no matter what. All even terms, ca you cannot have an even term polynomial that starts and ends in an opposite quadrant. It cannot exist. They end in quadrants like that. And it, it makes sense when you think about it. And the second thing that they keep hidden in this chapter for quite a while is something called the second derivative. And I really want you to learn it now. The second derivative is very powerful. When you find your max or min points using first derivative, they want you to measure points on either side of the derivative to determine if it's a max or min either whether it's higher in terms of in the first equation or whether the slope is up or down because if it's decreasing here and increasing here if the derivatives increasing on this side and decreasing on this side it's obviously a minimum point so they want you to do that however if you take the x value you found for the min point and you put it into the second derivative what's the second derivative it's the derivative of the first derivative so second derivative is simply the first derivative is simply the derivative of the first derivative. If you put that x value into the second derivative and it comes out positive, you're dealing with a min point. If it comes out negative, you're dealing with a max point. That's really useful. The other great tool for the second derivative is when you make it equal zero, you get what's called an inflection point. What's an inflection point? Okay, if you've been on a toboggan hill, you'll know it starts flat. Then it gets really, really steep, really, really, to that point maybe. And then it gets less, less, less steep. The inflection point is when the slope of the uh, tangent line is starting to change direction again. So here, from this peak here all the way to here, the slope clearly was getting steeper and steeper. But from this point onwards, it's clear the slope is getting less and less steep. And that's called an inflection point. When the second derivative is equal to zero, you find these inflection points. Now there's a limit to how many inflection points. For instance, an x squared parabola has no inflection points. And you might say, sure, it turns around. It turns around right there. Well, we're not talking about a turning point. We're talking about when the slope is changing direction. Well, this slope is constantly going from this part to this other direction. And you might say, yeah, the, the, clearly the slope changed. No, but the slope was always slowing down. And you might say, no, there it's speeding up again. No, but that's still a slowdown from over here. If you want to sort of see what I mean, the slope here, let's say, would be minus 10. Then you get minus 2. Then you get 0. Then you get plus 2 and plus 10. But you see that change that's going on on this side here will match the exact opposite of that side. That change in slope is consistent which means the second derivative has no inflection point. So when the slope is consistently changing, it means there's, no, there's never ever a inflection point. This is a change in how the slope is behaving. It's going from steep, steep, steep to suddenly narrow, narrow, narrow. And yeah, you can say it's steep, 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 slow here. You're right. So it's uh, technically that's one long inflection point, and then it's getting another direction. But the rate of change of the slope is not changing. Hard, hard to understand, but a second derivative is essentially measuring the rate of change of the first derivative. If that rate of change is never changing, there is no inflection point. The inflection points only happen when the second derivative hits zero and suddenly changes. And what's more, my values of second derivative, all my if I punch in x into my second derivative up here, will be negative, and on the other side of the inflection, it'll be positive. And that's because that's the useful tool for finding the min-max is because the rate of change of this slope is positive. The rate of change, sorry, is negative. 
and the rate of change of this slope is negative. In other words, the slope's getting less and less. Yeah, you're saying what? And I get it, but just keep in mind this. Derivative one measures rate of change of the function. Derivative two, or second derivative, measures the rate of change of the first derivative. And that's the key. So when this second derivative goes from negative to positive, it means suddenly the slope on the first or the first derivative will be changing direction, an inflection point. When it's equal to zero, we will find that inflection point. If we find the min max points and we punch the x value into the second derivative, when it comes out positive, we know we're at a bottom. When it comes out negative, we know we have a top, and you get the x value from the first derivative set to zero. And in case you didn't catch on that, when you set the first derivative to zero, you will find your max and your min points. Again, there can be many of them, right? Here I have one inflection point, two inflection points, three inflection points, four inflection points. This one's going on forever that way. This one's going on forever that way. There's one, two, three, four. Looking at this graph, assuming I don't have a, a uh, an invisible one, I can see that it's an even function and it's a negative beginning because it started down here in quadrant three and ended in quadrant four. I can also tell you that if that was a parabola, this would be a cubic, that would be four. I can tell by how many turning points it has. So one, two, three, four, five. I can tell you that this is x to the power of six. And that makes sense because there's four inflection points and you can only have two less than the power of inflection points, one less, one, two, uh, one less to the power in turning points. And you can cross the x intercept the same number of power, power, power. So an x to the six can have max six x intercepts. It can have five max turning points and can have four max inflections and less. You might say, how could you have less? Well, you could have a x to the power of six thing that never touches, that never touches the uh, x-axis. It can exist all the way up here, or can it can exist all the way down here. So that's why we say maximum, maximum six x-intercepts one, two, three, four, five, six. Maximum five turning points. And maximum four inflection points. That's at the middle. I, they're kind of close to the x-axis to see them. This is all important information. Now, when you're dealing with x cubed, x to the five, x to the seven, or any odd power, they always start in quadrant three and end in quadrant one. And they have the same rules that we just went over there. It can have three max, three max x-intercepts, two max turning points or max mins, and one max inflection. Let's have a look at that. I'm going to pretend I have a normal x, y here. Okay. And I'm just going to do a normal one. I'm going to go up, turn once, turn back. That's my only inflection point right there. That's where the slope was getting steeper and then change direction. And yes, this is consistently a negative double. The second derivative is consistently negative. Right there, the second derivative becomes positive and forever on becomes positive. And that's saying that the rate of change of my first derivative is changing directions right there. And if you look at it, again, you're going to say, well, the turning point is changing direction. Yeah, but it's consistently changing direction. That's a complete opposite direction. For instance, if I had something that's a parabola, never has an inflection point. It's always consistent. The rate of change is very consistent throughout. Just, I'm going to have to trust a little bit. So that means this can have five max x intercepts, four max turning points, 
um, and three max inflections. Now the only negative, the only time that doesn't start in quadrant three and end in quadrant one is when there's a negative in front of it. And then of course it flips, it gets reflected in the x-axis. It'll start up here and it'll end down there. So these basic things, when you understand just looking at a graph, what you're going to find are really helpful. The other thing you should always focus on, whether it's a rational or a polynomial, are the intercepts. It's easy to put 0, x is equal to 0, into the original equation. So y-intercepts are always easy. x-intercepts are tough. However, you should, when you can't factor it, um, because y is, y is equal to 0 at x-intercepts, if you can't factor it, you should use the quadratic equation. And just and it's more information you have where this thing crosses x-intercepts, the better. What's the next thing you should do? Well, for rational functions, you're going to also find always, the ver these are the first things you're, you're going to should do, the vertical asymptote. And that's values of x at the denominator that can't uh, be 0 or can't create a 0. Then you should always find your horizontal asymptotes. And to find this for rationals, you will look at the power at the biggest power in the numerator and the biggest power in the denominator. And I'll give you some examples. When they're even, when the top thing is x to the 4 and the bottom thing is x to the 4, you must then look at the numbers in front of that. And just ignore that. What's that divided by that? It's 4, so the horizontal asymptote is going to be equal to 4. So when they're even power, when they're matching powers, you must divide their numbers to find out where the horizontal asymptote is. When the power below is bigger, even by 1, your horizontal asymptote is going to be this. And we're going to learn something, and when the power is much bigger up top, you're not going to have a horizontal asymptote, but we're going to learn something new this chapter. When it is just one bigger, when it is just one bigger, you're going to have something called an oblique, an oblique asymptote, sort of diagonal asymptote. Now, this makes sense when you realize what's going on here. We have a one bigger function than this. It's essentially a line. So this line is going to continue along its merry way, except that because of this down here, you're going to have these weird interruptions in the line, possibly many if it's to the 3. And this line's going to suddenly zip up or suddenly zip down, continue on its way, suddenly zip up, however many asymptotes there are. But ultimately, it's going to continue on its way at the extremes. And that creates what's called a horizontal asymptote. Sorry, an oblique asymptote. So you'll want to folk you want to learn how to do that. It's not going to happen often. The other thing you always want to do is find out what happens. Find out what happens to this graph when x is negative infinity and positive infinity. So that's the next thing. So you should plug in huge values of x to see what value of y. And this will tell you where it ends up. Now obviously if you're dealing with a a polynomial you already know based on its power but if you're dealing with a rational this is a very useful tool to see where the graph is going to end up and it, a rational it's often hugging the asymptote or it's off into infinity okay so that's important to find out and then fu this is this is the other this is before you ever do anything now after you found the vertical asymptote the horizontal asymptote the extremes you should test x values near the asymptotes before we get to that so what I, what I mean by that you should get really good at drawing this stick line and on this stick line you're going to put a bunch of interruptions okay and let's say there's a vertical asymptote at minus 3 minus 7x so you're going to put this minus 7x and let's say it crosses the x-intercept at minus 3 and let's say it crosses the x-intercept again at 2 and let's say it has a, um, a vertical as asymptote here at uh, 9. So on the left side of this x value, you're going to put in, actually to the left of the equation, you're going to put in all the, if it's one big polynomial, you're going to put in one big polynomial. But if you have it in factored form, like this, you're going to put them all to the left, whether it's in the numerator 
for the denominator. And then you can say, okay, I'm going to test values to the left of this. I'm going to say minus 8. And I'm going to put minus 8 into each of these. And on the right side, I'm going to say whether this would come out positive or negative with that value of minus 8. You can take minus 10. You can take anything to the left of this that makes your life easier. And when you come out with minus positive minus, if they're all matching, you're going uh, you're going to have to multiply and see. You're going to say, okay, well, minus times a positive will be a minus times another minus will be a positive. So everything to the left of my minus 7 for this polynomial or rational function will be positive. Good chance it's going to be negative here, but you should test. So what's a number between minus 3 and minus 7? Now well, let's just say minus 4, some, something that's easy. And you're going to plug it in, and you're going to have the same value. Value's going to happen. You say, okay, a plus times a minus is a minus. Minus times a minus is a plus. So all my values between here are plus which means all the y values are plus. They're all above the x-axis. And this is going to help you draw your curve. And of course, this is an asymptote, so you should test right near the asymptote to see if it dives straight down or s does this weird wiggle, because some of them can, can cross and go up. And that's why you got to test near the x-intercepts to see what happens. So then you test between this with the same method. You test between this with the same method. And you test way to the right but with the same method. This really just helps you know for your rational functions how to graph it. Now finally, and be aware not all these tools are going to work perfectly. That one is. But finally, you should take the first derivative and eventually get into the habit of taking the second derivative. And in the first derivative, you're going to set it to equal to 0. And you're going to find possible many points. Sometimes it's not going to be possible to find the first derivative. You can get a very complicated rational function. Just be aware that in the super complicated rational functions, let's see if I have any here. That's not that complicated. But I'll use it anyway. In this one, you don't even have to, when you're finding whether, let's suppose this became a first derivative instead of the actual function. If this was your first derivative after doing the quotient rule. You don't have to worry about this. You can just set the top to equal to zero. And what this, whatever this resolves to in the top is where a max or a min point is, if this is the first derivative. And that will tell you max or min. Now, why did I say use the second derivative as well? Because the book in the first three chapters sections is going to make you test on either side of this max or min to see what the slope is doing, whether it's increasing or decreasing, in order to determine whether it's a max or a min. And that's a bit of a pain in the butt. Whereas you can use the second derivative, and if it comes out negative, you're talking about a max for that x value. And if it comes out positive, you're going to have a min. And we'll get more into that. But anyway, if it's not factorable, use your quadratic function and you're going to discover an x point, let's say it's 2.3, and you can put it back into the original function, because remember this is supposedly a derivative, to find the y, and now you have nice little y, x, y values. You have nice little x, y values of where your graph has turning points, max and mins. Also, when you take the second derivative, so let's say that comes out to something simple. It won't, by the way, because remember the, the second derivative will include the denominator. You can set that to equal to 0 and use your quadratic function, and you will find nice little inflection points. So this one will only have 1. And you're going to discover this is a great way of mapping your polynomials. So the first and second derivatives work really well for polynomials, but you'll also use it for rational. Sometimes it won't be possible. So just be aware, if it starts getting too complicated, abandon it you want to find other methods of doing it. Um, you'll be surprised, but you want to run through all the things. So to recap all the steps, and I'm going to keep them there because I'll probably miss a few. Intercepts are the easiest thing to start with. X is equal to 0. That's the easy, easy one. Y is equal to 0. Sometimes hard and not possible. So don't kill yourself on that just yet. Um, next thing you should look for is vertical asymptotes for your rationals and horizontals. The next thing you should look at is find extremes. 
change that x to positive infinity and to negative infinity just to see what the y values to see what the y values do and then you should also uh, find all rational functions will let you find them find all do a line graph of all vertical asymptotes and x-intercepts and find out if the y values are positive or negative on each side of them. This is huge. That last one is huge. So get really good at that. Finally take first derivative, set to zero to find min-max. They're going to want you to test uh, rates of increase. They might even ask what are the what are intervals of increase from where to where from x to what x um, and if they don't you can also just take second derivative and you can set that to zero and you will find inflection points and also use I'll just do this to find if max or min. So again, negative, if you take the x value from your first derivative and put it into second, negative is equal to a max, a negative result, and a positive result is equal to a min. Those are the big, big graphing tips, and you really want to get good at it, because some of these graphs are crazy. And the best tool for that is Desmos. Because you should, you might as well get used to what these graphs do. So look at this example. This is a simple one. We got a parabola over a just one thing. So obviously I've got a uh, vertical asymptote, and here there's here's that diagonal asymptote I was talking about, that oblique asymptote. You can sort of see it, and I'm going to turn on the graph that represents it right there. How did I come up with that? This is something you're also going to have to do. So you can see that the power of this one is one bigger than the power down here, and that's when uh, oblique asymptotes will occur. And they're the only ones you can figure out. And I'm going to show you how you figure them out right now. So pause videos whenever you want to get it. How did I figure that out? So I took this. And I put it over here. And don't worry, you don't have to do the complete long division. And I took what it was dividing by, like this. And I have said, okay, how many times, I put a nice big long division bar here. And I said, how many times do I have to multiply this by to get x squared? Well, I just have to multiply by x. So I get x squared, just like long division. But what is x times minus 1? Well, it's minus 1x. And now we subtract this line, just like long division this becomes 0 plus 7x minus minus x so you got to be careful is 8x how many times does x go into 8x well it goes plus 8 times now you can just stop there because oblique asymptotes are always going to be line functions you don't need to figure out the rest I'm going to show you something in interesting as I keep going but right there I now have the formula for my oblique asymptote. It's a line like that. It goes through 0, 0,8 and my graph is going to either hug it like that or hug it like that. And in this case, it's going down and up. Okay, so that's the first step. I want to keep going in this division, in this long division, just to show you something. Okay, you don't have to. That's just good enough for the obliques. Okay, so 8 times x is 8x. 8 times minus 1 is minus 8. So obviously, um, I get 8x. Oh, sorry. i got to bring down the 4 here. So I get 8x plus 4. When I multiply this 8 times x minus 1, I get 8x minus 8. When I subtract them, I get 0 here. And this becomes a plus. So I get 12. Now, I'm going to write this with just this 12. So what did I get? I get x plus 8. So I can say f of x is equal to x plus 8 
What was my remainder? 12 all over x minus 1. Now you're going to see uh, functions in your book like this, and this is the exact same thing as that. Oh, and I should have kept that, by the way. Let's see if I can... I don't think it's going to... Oh, it is going to let me bring it back. There we go. Is the exact... Maybe I can just get a pure copy. Yeah, I can get a pure copy. There we go. This is the exact same thing as that. And if you don't believe me, put it in the Desmos. So, you'll see sometimes in the book like that, and you're like, how do I figure this graph out? Well, don't you remember your rules of fraction? Don't remember, if you don't remember, I, something I always say is there's a one. These numbers are always over one. And this is a fraction. And how do you add fractions? Well, you have to make sure their denominators are the same. And this is sort of reversing what we just did, by the way. So I know that this denominator is x minus 1. This is over 1. How do I get its denominator the same as that? Well, I multiply it top and bottom by that. I'm not changing it. I'm just uh, changing the denominator. When you multiply something by 1, you're not changing it. And the same with this one. This one's missing the denominator, so I multiply it by x minus 1 like that. Now, they all have the same denominator now, so I can just replace it with that because these that's why I did it. What am I left with up top? Well, x times x is x squared. x times minus 1 is minus x. 8 times x is plus 8x. 8 times minus 1 is minus 8 plus 12. Right here, this becomes plus 7x, and this becomes plus 4. Oh, wait a minute. So sometimes you might see your graph presented this way, but no, it also has a representation this way. And this is essentially just the factored out format of this graph. It's saying it had a remainder of 12, and that was the divider. And so this right away pretty much tells you the oblique line, and it only, it'll only work for when there's one power above. What about for more complicated ones? What if I have a 4x cubed minus 7x squared plus 7, all divided by 5x squared, right? Minus uh, 6x plus 2. Well, it's still long division. Um, and let me just make life a little easier and just say it's like that. It's still long division. And you still have to ask yourself, how? what do I have to multiply 5x by to get 4x cubed? Well, I know I have to multiply x. And how do you turn a 5 into a 4? Okay, I have to multiply it by 4, because I know I definitely want a 4, over 5. When that happens, these cancel out. I'm left with a 4. This is a good trick, by the way. So that means this goes into this 4 fifth time. Wow, well, that's complicated. Well, just do it. x times x is x cubed. 4 fifths times the 5 leaves a 4, because I just see right there. What about the second thing? Okay, 4 times... Um, I picked a really tough one, by the way. 4 times um, 6 is minus 24, divided by 5, x. And you're right. It is not going to be easy to do this next one. But that's okay. So I'm just going to get rid of my sample here. Now we subtract them. This, of course, becomes 0. This turns into a plus. 24 over 5 is pretty much 5. So I know I'm dealing with 4 and 4 fifths. When I add, a, um, when I add that to 7, so negative 7, right? So negative 7 plus 4 and 4 fifths is negative 3. Now I've got to still add the 4 fifths. So it's negative 2 and 1 fifths. If I put that into fractions, that's negative 11 fifths. If you want, you can just convert this negative 7 into fifths, and you get negative 35 fifths. And when I add 24 to that, I get negative 11 fifths. And don't forget the x, because this became x squared. And so I still have that many x squareds. Complicated, you're saying. Don't worry. We only need the line. So I just need to keep that. I can get rid of all that, really. 
Okay, so I have that. Now I need to figure out how many times f what 5 can go into that. Well, I know it's going to be a plus x for sure. And how do I turn a 5 into an 11 over 5? I have to multiply it by 11. And not over 5, but 25. And that way these will cancel out. The 11 will just stay and I'll have a 5. So now I know that I have to multiply it by 11 over 25. When I do that, I get plus 11 over 5x. And you, you might, your mind might be blown right now, and that's okay. I don't need the x there, because I just need the number, because I started with the x. And boom, I have my line. Now let's test that out. You might say, oh, the math of that was incredibly hard. Now it's just... You're just subtracting fractions. I chose a hard one by accident, but that's okay. So I'm saying now that I'm going to have a vertical or oblique asymptote with this formula for, um, oh man, I can't remember which one I took. I should have kept it all. Let's see if I, I need to keep a copy of this. Oh, I didn't even keep the damn... Oh, it would have helped if I kept the damn thing. I could work backwards, I suppose. I should have just picked an easier one. Trust me, this will be... <laughs> what a useless demonstration. This will be the horizontal ace of the... You're going to come across it, because the book's going to make you do a, a gazillion of them, okay? Let's just get right into the book. So they're going to walk you through your basic skills, and I'm not going to do that. But... Here's one that you better get back to practicing. And it's right, where is it? Inequalities. You're going to have to get back into your inequalities. Right there. Very useful to figure out when is a graph below a certain point. And uh, there's tons of videos on inequalities. Just go to them. Okay, so solve. So they just want you to practice your factoring. Even this, you got to practice your synthetic division. I can see that if y is 1, that's one of the factors, so i, I got to practice my synthetic division for that. They want you to recognize that this is a parabola with the vertex visible, that this is a parabola with only the y-intercept visible, that this is a rational function that will have x is equal to minus 2 over it, and it will have a horizontal asymptote of y is equal to 2, that this is a parabola again with only, yeah, we just did that, and that, that, that is a... Uh, radical shifted two to the right. So I just want you to be aware of it. They also want you to be aware of limits. We're approaching two from the negative side. So obviously it's approaching zero overall. But they want you to take a minute uh, value. And you see that it's a plus, And that makes sense because this is a parabola that's shifted down by four. And as we approach two, which is the x-intercepts, we're going to be approaching... Um, the the x-axis, 0. This as well, they just want you to take, for this one you need to factor it out, and you can't be able to, it's a difference of cubes, look it up, and you're going to be factoring that out so that you'll be able to plug 3 into the top one quite easily to figure out the limit. And again, it's more of the value that it approaches. And that, that's not a terrible one to, to explain, actually. So I believe the factoring out for this, when I do that, and I'll verify it, and boy am I rusty on this, it's x squared plus, is it it's gonna, this is a cube, so it's 3, I believe it's plus 6x, and then plus 9, let's see, so I get x squared plus 6x squared, sorry, x cubed, plus 6x squared, plus 9x, minus 3x squared. Uh, minus 18x, uh, minus 27. So there's the minus 27, there's the x cubed. And these are not canceling out. 
so I, get, I got something wrong. So I just look up difference of, you know, I gotta stop being stubborn. Difference of cubes. And somebody's gonna present you with a nice step-by-step -step chart, especially if you hit images. And there it is, and that's what I should have done. So it's just minus A, B. That's the positive ones, there it is. So it's plus the two times together, that's all. So I made it more complicated than I had to. So it's just 3x and 9. So that'll be x cubed plus 3x squared plus 9x minus 3x squared. That's how they cancel out. Minus 27. And you're set. So right away you can see that these cancel out. And then when I plug in the limit of 3, I get 9 plus 9 plus 9. 27. So this graph essentially will be approaching 27 uh, as x approaches 3, but you can't calculate it unless you practice your factoring. And again, let's see if that's true. x minus x cubed minus 27 all over x minus 3. And we're going to make it an f of x, and we're just going to find out what happens as we approach positive 3. We're going to get a hole, I believe. Undefined, but just before it, you can see 27, 27. Okay, so notice it's a parabola, and all that did was create a hole, which makes sense once we factored it, where we're left with a parabola. So they just want you to get used to your knowledge base again. Uh, limits. Uh, they want you to practice your derivative. You're going to notice that these fours cancel out. This is going to become more important in uh, integral calculus in chapter 7, I think it is. Chain rule. Quotient rule. Quotient rule and chain rule. This is what we, I did. They want you to get used to knowing remainders and understanding what remainders are and how the, this graph is the same as this whole graph. So essentially this rational function can be expressed like this. A line plus a number plus a constant plus a rational function. And then they want you to get practice uh, practicing taking the derivative, which is, you know, you're gonna do it a thousand times. And you know what? You know what this is all about? It's about weeding out laziness. Because everybody wants a shortcut. So if you're going to find out uh, who can do this stuff and who can't, you're going to weed them out away from science, which is what, as society, we want. When this becomes 2, it becomes 1 minus 2. So this is the derivative. So to find it, we have to take factors and we have to find out something that adds up to multiplies to minus 6 and adds up to plus 1. So obviously that's going to be x uh, and this is not the exact factors yet. Plus 3 x minus 2 and when I divide by 3 I get x plus 1 and 3x minus 2. Let's make sure. 3x squared minus 2x plus 1 almost. Three x squared plus two x minus three x still not right. Oh yeah, sorry, I had it right the first time. I think so. I get x three x squared minus two x plus three x minus two. Got it. Okay, so now I know that uh, the and this is a great example when x is equal to minus one, or when x is equal to two thirds. I've got a max or min on this chart. Okay, but wait, what is it, a max or min? So I, now I want you to practice taking the second derivative because they're not gonna teach you that for a couple. What's the second derivative? And that's just the derivative of the first derivative. So I'm gonna get six x plus one, and I'm gonna plug in minus one here. What do I get? I get minus seven plus one, It's a, I get a negative. So if this is at the negative for second derivative, I'm dealing with a max. Now I'm going to put two thirds into this equation. I get uh, four plus one, five, and this is positive. So I know I'm dealing with a min. So the second derivative 
at that X point came out positive I'm dealing with a min came out negative and I'm teaching you now because they're gonna want you to test on either side of it okay so now what are those points if I put minus one up here I get minus one plus a half plus two plus three so these cancel out a bit I get 4.5 so my max point is at negative one 4.5 and what about two-thirds two-thirds cubed is eight twenty-sevenths plus that's where it gets complicated right plus four ninths times half so two ninths um, minus four thirds plus three so if you look at all that I'm not going to calculate it perfectly I just want you to remember if you look at it carefully that's about eh, one third that's about one quarter minus four thirds plus three so minus two thirds plus a quarter two thirds plus a quarter we're really talking about quarter if I put four minus eight and three we're talking about minus five thir twelfths and I think I said plus three so what's three minus five twelfths it's about two point mm, just under five four seven so I'm saying that this point is the other point is two thirds comma two point four seven or zero zero point six six comma two point four seven let's go take this put it into Desmos and see don't know if I have it right yet let's see plus point minus two x plus three and I could have done a calculation here, so I'm not going to. Now, here's the nice thing about um, this. You can set this to equal to the first derivative, and you can set another one equal to the second derivative. And they'll graph them for you if you want to see them. There's the first derivative is a parabola, and the second derivative, of course, is a line. So this could be an acceleration curve, but let's have a look. And I'm going to set my... I'm going to set my 0 to equal to h of x. And I'm going to discover there's my one of my points, and there's the other point, just as I discovered. And now we're going to take our f of minus 1. Yep, and we're going to take our f of 0.6666. Now, I did my calculations off a little bit. But you can see, sure enough, that we're talking about those max points right there and those min points and sure enough that's a min point and that was indeed a max point the other thing you can do for the second derivative is you can set it to zero and you're going to discover the inflection point which is right there so now you know an inflection point from the second derivative and there's only one inflection point on a cubic so we learned a lot. We could have also f discovered quite easily what the that the y-intercepts right there. I'm just going to get rid of that. Sure enough, and we could have set the whole thing equal to zero to hopefully discover that. But that would have been very difficult uh, to discover um, because it's a cubic, and it, it's hard to factor a cubic if they're not uh, they don't have pure factors. So that's a great that's a great tip. I forgot on graphing. Always see if you can factor them, and that's a huge one that I should have added. Keep an expanded version and also a factored version handy because you can gain information from both. Now sometimes you can't factor. Often actually you can't factor, but sometimes you can, and they want you to be able to spot it especially during a test they're going to give you factorable things okay get, getting back to this uh, they want you to explain in words and personally that to me this is the same as the chain rule so whatever and behavior so that's a great example you want to plug in huge values of this so we're dealing with a parabola it's upward facing I can already tell you the end behavior is as X approaches negative and positive infinity Y approaches positive infinity 
this is a cubic and it's in it's reverse of what's normal so instead of st uh, starting at the bottom it's starting for the top and going down I can already tell you the end behavior they behave the same way so don't start over guessing yourself second guessing this is a power to the four and it's facing down so it's going to end for x is negative infinity and positive infinity y is going to be negative infinity on both ends this is a power to the five and it's normal power to the five start here so that means for negative x infinity y infinity will be negative as well and this is not the x to the five x to the five will look like that and it's as x approaches positive infinity y approaches negative infinity what they want you to do though is get used to plugging in values uh, to sort of testing it but you should know your functions that's the point you're gonna save yourself hours for each function determine the reciprocal and see what happens so what's the reciprocal of that they just want you to get used to that oh thanks thanks for nothing let's see if I can pull it up again we haven't even gotten to the test yet how sad is that I mean, I'm gonna have to quit soon so we'll call just this just pre warm up okay what's 1 over 2 of X what's suddenly it's turned into a rational function the vertical asymptote is at X is equal to 0 and we're gonna have sort of a normal thing because it's gonna be Y is equal to 0 as well what about that one let's rephrase it actually let's keep it that way but we're gonna siphon out it's quite easy to see that when X is 3 it's a rational function that that has this and its horizontal is still going to be y is equal to 0 and that's what it's going to look like mm, they just want vertical isotopes okay what about this one remember that the uh, reciprocal is the whole thing over so right away you can see that for it to become 0 this whole thing has to be 0 can x plus 4 squared ever equal minus 1? In other words, this has to be one, uh, minus 1 for this to be 0. Well, the answer to that is no. There's no value I can put in for x. Therefore, there is no uh, vertical asymptote. What you're going to see with this is something weird. So this is normally a parabola, right? So notice the big values over here. When we have 1 over big values, it's going to get very small. So you're going to see a graph that's hugging goes up and then hugs again if in doubt just put in any random parabola 5x squared plus 7x plus 2 I've made that a little too big so let's just make it 1 nope because that's a possible we've got to find out let's just do what they did which is x plus 2 squared plus 1 or plus 2 is good there that's what I was going for now notice the role that the 2 played the 2 played the biggest bump so if I put that at plus 1 oh yeah no so it's this here that's playing the biggest bump right there so even if I have plus 7, I'm just making the bump flatter or smaller. Let's make a really small number. Oh, maybe not that small. Yeah, there we go. Ooh. There we go. So let's change this to plus 3. What do you think will happen to that bump? I'd say it moves over to the left to x minus 3. And sure enough, it did. So that makes sense because when x is minus 3, this is creating the smallest possible result, which is 0. And you're going to get 1 over 0.1, which creates a 10. So when this whole thing becomes zero, that's when this graph will hit a peak. So keep that in mind. It helps to know these graphs, and this clearly could measure something. Um, what will happen with this one? Same rule, except now we have a possible... Uh, no, we still don't have a... Po yeah, we do have a possible zero when x is minus 3. So this plus 1 prevented possible zeros. But now we can see that when this is minus 3 the whole thing can't exist so what we're gonna have here is it's gonna try to do this but when it hits X is equal to minus 3 it's gonna go tearing off 
in one direction and the opposite direction. So it's going to sort of look like that. So let's have a look at that. I'm going to just essentially get rid of this part of it. Oh, it's tearing off on both sides positive because it's squared. Sure enough, you've got a value that can never be existed. So it's trying to do that hump thing. But suddenly there's a vertical asymptote. On either side, it's going to be positive, which makes sense because there's no negative possible values from this function. So they, they just want you to understand. And you know what? You're going to say, I don't want to spend all this time. Every minute you spend on this stuff will make your university courses that much easier. Um, and then again, they want you to figure out x-intercepts. So y-intercepts are always easy to figure out because x is equal to 0. Uh, x-intercepts are not as much. So we'll just call that pre. So here they're going through intervals of increase. So from here to the turning point is an interval of decrease because the slope is negative. And from 0 onward is an interval of increase because the slope is positive. And they're, they're making you do this to test out whether you have a max or a min using the derivative reason about intervals of increase. So obviously, if the slope is negative, it's decreasing. And if the slope is positive, it's increasing. Kind of makes sense. So if we just do our own thing here, let's do our own cubic cubed plus 2x, no, minus 4x. There we go. That's good enough. I'm going to tell you the points of increase. It's increasing all the way, but not including that point. Then it's decreasing all the way, not including that point. Then it's increasing all the way, not including that point. So obviously, if I find a min or a max, and I'm not sure what it is, and I take a measurement of the derivative on the left, and it's negative, and a derivative on the right, and it's positive, I know I have a min. If I have a max and I take a derivative on the left and I know it's a positive and a derivative on the right, I know it's negative, I know I have a max. And that's because that's the only way it could happen. It's going to be a positive slope if it's a max on the left and a negative slope on the right. It's going to be a negative slope on the left and a positive slope, a positive derivative on the right if it's a min. I like second derivative better though. Okay, Second derivative will also call you show you this important point which is called a inflection point that's when the slope suddenly is changing its rate of change to the other direction otherwise the curve would never turn all important to understand and they just want you to get used to rate of increases so I have a rate of increase here and a rate of increase here so that's how I would note it and the only rate of decrease I ha have is from minus 0.667 not including it all the way down to 0.667 not including it so this whole chapter is going to do that and it's going to let you use it to figure out this stuff so that you can say ah it's a min point then I give consider this graph graph f of x so if you know that this is the derivative you know that it came from, since it's a parabola, that it came from a cubic. You also know some key points in that cubic, in that um, when these two x-intercepts uh, happened for this derivative, it was a max and a min point. Now, since the rate of change is positive here and negative there, you know that this is going to be a max point, and this is going to be a min point on the graph, and that's what they're teaching you to draw over here. Might as well show you. What information can I get from this? Okay, note right there, and they're not perfect, which is a shame, but I've got 3 comma 0 and let's say negative 0 0.5 comma 0, which means if I was going to graph this, I also would note that the slope here is negative and the slope here is, sorry, the slope here is positive. The slope here is negative. So that means this point here is a max. So that means that I would have at negative 0.5 somewhere, I have a max. Now we're going to get into where you put it and why in a second. Okay. It also means that over here, 
at 3.0, I have a min. I also want to note that this is an upward facing parabola, which means the derivative of the first term, which is x squared, came out positive, which means that the third term, or the original function, was also positive. So I know it starts here, and I know it ends here. Um, I also know that this point here for um, this first derivative um, is a, not a turning point, sorry. It's going to be a point of inflection. So at, I will say it's minus one, but it's not, okay? Oh, sorry, a positive one. So we know that a positive one right here, roughly, that's when this curve is going to be curving down. Bad drawing. Let's see if I can get it roughly right. Yeah, I hate, I hate when nothing works. We know it's going to be a bump like that. And at that inflection point, we know it's actually going to change like that. There we go. And then it's going to turn around. I'm going to have that, that, and it's going to have something like that. Now, I suggest, since I only have this one inflection point, which makes sense, um, that it might not cross the x-axis twice. Um, might only cross once. And this is the only negative derivative, so this is going to be the only spot where it decreases. Let's see what else I can tell from that. Well, I know that it's going to be an x cubed. Oh, I know what I can tell from it. So right here, since I'm dealing with x minus 2, minus 3, let's say, and x minus uh, plus 0.05, that if I expand this, I get x squared minus 3x plus 0.5x. So I'm dealing with the minus 2.5x, right? And then minus, let's say, 1.5, okay? So now I know I'm dealing with something like that, and I know the derivative. It doesn't look stretched, because there's probably be a number in front here. But I know the derivative of that would have to be x cubed, and it would have to be over 3 sort of thing, in order for this just to come out pure. Now again, if it's stretched, it's not really visible. And for this, this one had to start as an x squared, Right? And the 2.5 came down in front, so it probably had like a x, we'll just say x squared, right? It comes down and becomes 2.5. So what do I multiply x by to get 2.5? Um, I multiply it by uh, 1.25. So I know that I'm dealing with a negative 1.25 here. And then this would just was an x, right? So it was just minus 1.5x. So now I have a good idea of what my graph looks like. It's not perfect, but I can definitely sort of get an idea of some values. So for instance, when x is 0, the only problem is you don't have a con you're missing your constant because that disappears in a derivative. But if x is 0, we can see that we're dealing with pretty much a zero and then we just don't know let's see let's see what the book says actually because I think I'm missing a key step oh yeah it's one possible graph so notice they kind of did what I did but they made it a bit lower they found the uh, the inflection point by accident Yeah, and then they just sort of used, they just took the values on either side. So they looked, I looked at the negative positive, and they just took values of either side. So their graph is a little bit lower than the graph I did. Now notice you can't get a lot of information about this because there could be all sorts of cubics that resulted in, in this derivative. Could have had all sorts of constants that raised it or lowered it where the second derivative would be useful. And then they just go through the summary. We'll do that next time.